Good evening, everyone. My name is Sahib Singh, and tonight it gives me pleasure to announce our guest. It's going to be the Director of Army Budget, Major General Paul Chamberlain. Sir, it's an honor to have you here tonight, um, you know, live from the Pentagon. Uh, once again, <laughs> thank, you. Um, thank you for coming on. Um, sir, real quick, we're just going to ask you a simple question, right? One thing that stands out, I've always noticed this, is that long tab. So go ahead and explain that because you don't really see a lot of uh, finance officers uh, with long tabs on. So first, let me just start off with, uh, it's my pleasure being here as well. Uh, I'm honored and humbled to be here tonight and sharing whatever it is that, that comes up and what folks want to ask. Uh, we'll go through some of the questions and if I don't like the question, I'll probably growl at whoever asked it. Uh, but other than that, everything is fair game. So the long tab, um, quite honestly, I forget that it's there most days. Um, it was just something that I sort of wanted to do. I would tell you that um, the first time uh, I saw a Green Beret was in Vilsack, Germany, when during my first duty assignment, uh, I was there going through a, uh, believe it or not, a chemical officer course, because that was an additional duty as a lieutenant. Uh, I was learning about downwind messages and downwind dangers uh, and a SF beret or an SF soldier walked by wearing the green beret and I said, that looks kind of interesting. So uh, that's really uh, what got me interested. I went to the bookstore, I bought a book and started reading about green berets. And the next thing you know, a couple of years later, uh, I was going through selection. Nice. So what what's one of the biggest experiences or your most memorable experience from selection, sir? Uh, I would tell you that it's uh, obviously a lot of things that go on in selection you're, you're not supposed to talk about. But one of the things that a lot of folks already know about is, you know, there is a lot of road marches. Uh, one of the last road marches is a longer road march. And I will tell you that I was the very last person in the class of roughly 200. It was so bad that I was on the side of the road. My ruck had broken. Uh, you weren't allowed to have flashlights. Um, they took all the flashlights. They took all your matches. You couldn't produce any light. Uh, and you had to figure out how to make do with what you had. So uh, I knew where the 550 cord was in the ruck. I pulled it out. I tied a couple of knots together, got the ruck back up on my back. And as I was doing that, um, there was other some other uh, selection uh, instructors out there and they were actually pulling down the last of the chem lights that was marking the trail. They, uh, they yelled and growled at me and said, um, you probably need to get going. I said, I know I've got a broken ruck. I've been trying to fix it in the dark. And uh, so I started moving out. I passed 10 people on the way back and I said, that's it. I won't be last. That's good enough. Um, came in uh found out that i really wasn't the last person but uh that's what they told me awesome good stuff but well, I, I mean obviously that's a, a good memory then sir to a certain point <laughs> well i don't know that it's a good memory but it's one that stands out uh being in the the last person or at least thinking you're the last person on a long road march cool agree so sir um something that you mentioned uh, i just caught wind of it you mentioned signal first so when exactly did you um uh, what to call like branch over or, or transfer over to, to, you know, the best, the best core in the army. <laughs> so I did start off in signal. Uh, I did that for, I guess the first four or five years, um, went to the infantry officer advanced course as part of getting ready to go into special forces, did selection, uh, then went into special forces for about four or five years. Uh, and then that led me to uh, really getting ready to go to, uh, or, or at the time we had to choose our functional areas and functional area was really a, a secondary job uh, as an officer in, in the army at the time. Um, I had no idea uh, what the functional areas were because as, as a signal officer, we were not required to have functional areas. So I never looked them up. Uh, signal was a shortage branch. So I figured I was not going anywhere. I was gonna stay in the signal corps. Um, go finance. He saw the light. <laughs> I'm not quite sure I'm going to be able to handle all of those, <laughs> but that's okay. So, uh, you know, I, I 
got to um, the SF branch and somebody called me, was the branch assignment officer and said, hey, you know what, uh, you need to pick a functional area. I said, what's a functional area? And uh, they said, well, it's your second job. I said, I haven't even gotten to my second job. I'm still trying to get into special forces. And they said, well, you need to choose one. So uh, I said, okay. I said, do you like money? I said, yeah, who doesn't like money? So mm -hmm. they, they said, put down comptroller. I said, okay, done. Put down comptroller for me. I'm good. Um, he then said, I need two more. I said, two more what? He said, functional areas. I said, comptroller, comptroller, comptroller. And that's how I ended up in the comptroller branch. Awesome, sir. Great. So let me ask you uh, this question, right? Uh, in regards to, you know, just your career overall, did, did you ever imagine you would get up to the position that you're at now, sir? Oh, good Lord, no. I was lucky to make first lieutenant. <laughs> well, let's come on, sir. In all seriousness, though, seriously. No, I, mean, I, I, I got to it. I, I really, look, I... I First off, I had no intention of coming into the Army. I had no intention of being an officer. Uh, my goal was probably watching too many John Wayne movies, watching Sands of Iwo Jima too many times. Uh, I figured that uh, the Marine Corps and being a gunny sergeant in the Marine Corps uh, was probably what I wanted to do most. My father said, eh, you know what, why don't you uh, at least apply to a couple of colleges and uh, see if you get in. I did, uh, ended up going to Clemson. Once there, uh, went into ROTC, figured I'd try to fly helicopters because I thought flying helicopters was cool. Um, as you can see, I, I didn't fly helicopters. Um, so some could classify my career as a failure because I didn't achieve my ultimate goal. Um, I just kept, kept doing different things. Uh, tried the Signal Corps, tried Special Forces, and then finally Comptroller just sort of stuck. Nice. So, sir, um, and now we're going to go over to, because one of the viewers actually has a question, um, and it's actually tied in with your actual position right now. So I'm going to bring that up on the screen, and I'll read it out to you, sir. Um, it says, what relationships exist between your office and the Army Reserves, and how are these connections leveraged to benefit the Army budget? Sure. So we work very closely with the Army Reserves. Um, the Army Reserve, uh, the G8, Mr. Mike Maxwell and I, we, we talk uh, on a regular basis, uh, if not uh, two or three times a week, sometimes more. Uh, we work with um, several folks over there, both developing the budget as we uh, put a budget together, uh, uh, trying to roll the budget out. Um, we also work with them th with execution, and we've been working very closely with both the Guard and the Reserve uh, with COVID-19, ensuring that the, the resources are flowing uh, to all compos because it is a total force that is required to meet all of the requirements that the Army is expected to meet in, with regards to the national defense strategy. Nice. Thank you, sir. Thank you for uh, elaborating on that. So, sir, uh, you mentioned uh, Clemson earlier, um, where you, know, you went to university. Um, there's a rumor going around. Uh, they say that you're a Gamecocks fan. <laughs> yeah, that's probably a misnomer. Uh, I have never been a Gamecocks fan. Um, have never, have never cheered for the Gamecocks, uh, and will not cheer for the Gamecocks. Uh, both my wife and I are met at, at Clemson. Uh, we are true orange all the way through, except when we wear the Clemson regalia purple. Got it. So, sir, um, again, another question. I'm not going to say who it's from, only because you might have them standing at attention or something on Monday. Um, but they say, hey, um, could, could Clemson... I want to have everybody standing at attention on Monday because I'm going to apply it to everybody equally. So so they say, hey... Starting, starting with the interviewer. What was that, sir? I said, I'm going to have everyone standing at attention, starting with the interviewer. <laughs> That, that's fine, sir. So, but could Clemson, even be half of a football team, if they were in the SEC and had the play in the same schedule as Alabama? Yeah, that's simple. The answer is yes. Of course, okay. they're going to win. All right, Next sir. So, again, let's, let's, move, 
I'm saying we're going to move on to, um, to another question. Yeah, well, yeah, but before we move on, you know, the, the real question is, are we going to have a, a college football season? And, and quite uh -huh. honestly, I think that's going to be a bit of a struggle. Um, and if we do, you know, what are the players, how are the players going to react when uh, there's no fans in the stands? Uh, or half the number of stand, fans that are in the stands on a traditional football Saturday. So it's going to be interesting, not only for the team, but also for the fans. Uh, and I just, I just don't know how this is all going to play out. Imagine running into the end zone, there's nobody cheering. Uh, agreed. Well, they might do what they do in the uh, NBA right now and have some screens over there. With the like screens, virtual. Yeah. Yep, we'll have all these faces of, of Sergeant Singh in the end zone. <laughs> Up on the hill next to Frank Howard's rock. If it helps the cause, why not, sir? Hey, that so, just tells me you're that just tells me you're a Clemson fan. <laughs> I don't know about all that, sir. Sure. That's what I just heard. So, sir, let me ask this. Um, I, I know obviously that you know you do not have a favorite ACOM, right? I mean, I know you love AFC, but we do have a question, right? And and it says, ask the dad, which is your favorite ACOM and why AFC? <laughs> So what's an ACOM? Army Command, sir. You guys coach me into saying we're not allowed to use acronyms. I agree, sir. So Army Command. Uh, okay, so the Army Command. And what's AFC? Army Futures Command, sir. Ah, okay. Or so, yeah. Future. No, I, I, don't, I do not have a favorite ACOM. Um, Army Future Command is the newest ACOM. Um, and we do work very closely with you guys, but you are also working with some of uh, the most um, current programs uh, and modernization programs that are really the um, in the limelight and identified by our senior leaders as the programs that are going to take us into uh, you know the 20, 2028 2035 as part of the Army modernization strategy as we as we look to take on uh, other near peer competitors and prepare for large scale ground combat operations. So. Yes, there is uh, a lot of attention applied to AFC, uh, but not necessarily because they're the favorite, but because a lot of the things that uh, Army Future, no, Gamecocks are not okay, nor is LSU Tigers. There's only one Tiger. Tide does not roll anywhere. Greg Hacker, you better be in the front leading rest position. With all that said, Going back to Futures Command, they're not necessarily the favorite. They do get a lot of attention just because of what they're trying to do at this point. Agree, sir. Thank you. Um, sir, we do have a question over here, um, and it relates to everything that's going on currently with, uh, with COVID-19. Um, I definitely want to get your insight on this. Um, so, sir, with the current no-growth environment and political climate, what are the biggest obstacles as we posture from a counter-extremist organization mission to more focused near-peer competitor climate? Uh, I would tell you that um, fiscally, the, the biggest challenge is we're liable to have a flat top line in our budget. Uh, COVID-19 is certainly not going to help that. Uh, but um, as we continue to try to modernize, we're going to have to balance legacy systems against the, the modernization sustainment at the same time for legacy and the modernization systems. It is going to be a very delicate balancing act. It's a balancing act that we, we have done before. We did it uh, in the early 2000s when we were you know, fighting uh, counterterrorism and modularizing the army. So we do have the ability to do it, but it's gonna be a, a tricky balancing act that's gonna require everyone to include all three compos ensuring that uh, we, we have identified the requirements early enough to get them into the budget cycle so that we can apply fiscal responsibility to them without having to make everything a year of execution bill. Nice. So again, thanks for that answer, sir, by the way. Um, sir, let's, let's talk about your, your current position right now. Um, you know, obviously, you know, we know we're, our senior leaders within the finance core, uh, obviously, they understand what you do, right? Um, especially if you're looking at the resource management side of the world. Um, for our junior soldiers and, you know, even mid-grade NCOs and even senior NCOs, let's talk a little bit about your position and ABLE as a whole and what that consists of. Okay. So what do you want to talk about? It's, well, we want to know what you do, sir. All right. 
What do I do? Uh, most of my day is really consumed with meetings, as you could imagine. Um, I would tell you that the, the biggest part of the, the job here is communication and coordination. It's ensuring that uh, there is crosstalk uh, um, between everyone on the staff. Uh, it's important that everyone knows what each each element of the staff is doing. Um, and you could imagine that in a building as big as the Pentagon, where there's 25,000 different folks working here, um, and even within just the Army, uh, sometimes not knowing what the left hand is doing uh, can, can be very challenging. So a lot of it is going to the meetings and ensuring the coordination is done. I would also tell you that uh, just about every day that I come in, uh, I have a plan of what I expect to get accomplished. And if I'm lucky if I get to 25% of that because there are a lot of pop-up issues that do require the, our attention immediately. Uh, when you were here, you saw some of them. In fact, you may have been on the receiving end of a couple of the taskers that came out of the front office uh, as a result of these hot fires that do pop up. Right. But uh, looking at the Army Budget Office or ABO, so looking at ABO, uh, you know, we do have four sections within ABO. Uh, we have what folks would consider the, the, the O&M section, but that's really my operations. Uh, within the operations and support, uh, we, we have uh, the O&M, the operations and maintenance dollars. We also do our MILPERS there, and we have our, our business operations also are in there. Uh, the next directive that I have is investments. Uh, that's where most of the procurement dollars are and the research and development funding is. Uh, you're very familiar with, with all of that. Uh, as you worked in BUI uh, as a liaison coming out of AFC. Uh, the procurement dollars and the RDT dollars, that's where we do our testing. That's where we, we test the new ideas that we're trying to put together in a weapon system. It's also once uh, a weapon system has been decided upon, where we then go out and procure those weapon systems or the trucks or the radios or whatever they might be. We have uh, seven or eight different appropriations within our investment directorate. My next directorate is uh, BUC or what we call our management and control. Um, and quite honestly, that's, that's the directorate that gets everything that doesn't fit neatly into O&M or into investments. Uh, they're my integration branch. They do the funds control. They help with budget formulation. Um, they get me ready for most of the meetings. They ensure that uh, when um, we are putting together the budget and rolling out the budget, they do a lot of the heavy lifting. They've got most of our databases. And then the, the last directorate is uh, my budget liaison. Um, we have a number of officers over there. Right now we only have three finance officers over there. So this is a pitch. You know, our, I need finance officers to apply to the Congressional Fellowship Program. Um, most of the officers uh, across the hall, uh, they're from different branches, which is fine. We need that as well. But uh, they do engage with Congress uh, and they engage with the appropriators. We have four different um, committees that we engage with. One or two are the, the HASC or the House uh, Appropriations Service Committee, and then the uh, SASC, which is the Senate version. And then we've got the HACD, which is the House Appropriation Committee for Defense. And then, of course, the SACD, which is Senate Appropriation for Defense. The appropriation committees give us the money, and the HASC and the SASC or the authorizing committees, they're the ones that authorize the money for us. So we have an engagement with uh, what we call, those are, are the, the committees of jurisdiction. Uh, we focus on the appropriators and then the Office of Congressional, Congressional Legislative Liaisons, another office in here that does not work within the Army Budget Office. They focus on the authorizers. But uh, my budget liaisons, uh, captains and majors and lieutenant colonels, uh, on a daily basis, they are over to, with Congress, uh, engaging with the, the professional staff members, uh, Michelle, Colonel Michelle Williams, she is the director. Uh, she is oftentimes engaging with each of the clerks for the appropriation committees. It's a great and fantastic job. Uh, we need more finance officers to apply for the, the Congressional Fellowship, as well as NCOs. So we do have uh, Sergeant, um, uh, shoot, I forgot his last name. Anyway, Sergeant Larry is over there and uh, he is, is um, doing great jobs. We've, uh, he's a second NCO that has been over there for us. Uh, Sergeant Major Gondak was over there last time. Thank you again, sir. Uh, I'm pretty sure anyone who heard that now kind of at least has an idea 
Um, and then for the audience that is watching, um, if you actually go on the YouTube channel, there is the, the video of Colonel Michelle Williams um, explaining exactly what OCL, uh, sorry, what Bull does um, and, and you know, how you can apply. And she actually uh, gave her information for you to actually reach out as well. So thank you again. Sir, uh, there's a whole thing going on now in the comments, you know, about ACOMs uh, and, you know, why you, sh you probably have different favorite ones. I'm just going to put up a couple on the screen, you know, apparently you used to sock things otherwise. We have uh, Forrest Com thinking otherwise as well and so forth. Now, we're going to... Back. <laughs> what was that, sir? So, because SFAC is there, I guess she means Special Forces Command, or is she talking about our, our Security Forces Command? Yeah, I'm not sure on that one, sir. They'll, I guess yeah. they'll come back in the I'm comments. Sure Sarah will pop up and let us know. <laughs> Agree. We're right, so getting we, a lot of attention, too. <laughs> we got another question, sir. Um, in your experience, what do you see as the likelihood <laughs> of a year-long CR? Uh, continuing resolution, sorry, in FY21, and if high, are there any mitigation factors to lessen the impact, right? And again, sir, if you can answer some of this, great. It's your opinion. You're not speaking on behalf of the Army or anything like that right now. So, so my opinion is we will likely start the year under a continuing resolution authority. I mean, all you have to look do is look back historically. Nine out of the last 10 years, we have started the year under a continuing resolution. There was only one year. Uh, 2019, in the last 10 years, where we started with a budget prior to the 1st of October. And um, it's important that we do that. Why? Uh, again, all you have to do is, is look at the metrics. So if you look at the metrics, uh, we met most of our metrics in 2019. Um, we had a much higher obligation rate through the first quarter and into the second quarter. And we easily made 80 the 80 percent, 20 percent rule. Um, going where we cannot execute more than 20% uh, of our budget in the last two months of the year. That's important. Everybody says the 80-20 rule, you, you got to make 80% by 31 July. That's true, but you can't spend more than 20% of your appropriations by the end of the year. So if you don't spend uh, at least 80.1% of your money, right. then theoretically, OSD could come and take the funding and pull it back for other uses within the department. And that happened. That happened in 2018. The Army missed 80-20 uh, by only 2% or 0.2 uh, percentage points. That's 0.2%. We lost over $400 million mm -hmm. and they took that money. Now, the good news is we did get some of it back, but it came back to us in a different appropriation for a different requirement. So instead of putting that $400 million into readiness, into parts, into uh, uh, contracts, um, we put it into something else. So that affected the commands, but it did allow us to get after some other munitions that we were looking to, to, to purchase. Gotcha. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for that, sir. So I guess they, they came back with the SFAC answer, by the way. It's, it's the security forces uh, assisting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. They, they come in. So they came in with the bill two years ago. All kinds of money needed $20 million in the last month to, to buy buffers and desks and whatnot. So uh, I'm very familiar with SFAC. So, so, sir, how, so since you mentioned that, right, without giving us an exact, you know, a, or a real scenario, give us an a example of, of how people do come up over there uh, asking and what are some of the steps that you have to take in order to, you know, get people the things they need, or, or I'll say the money they need in order to execute their mission. So there is a standard process. Um, uh, we, we call that the PEBS process, the planning, programming, budgeting, and execution uh, uh, process. Uh, so PEBS, uh, within PEBS, um, you know, there's the, the planning phase. Uh, the planning phase is done by the S3. Uh, that's their focus. And in fact, right now, we just started the planning phase and uh, took, uh, I think it's eight or 10 different briefs of, out of 56 specific issues that the, the S3 wanted to look at. Then you go into programming. So uh, the programming uh, is done by the G8. And, and there's a distinction in G8s here in the Pentagon versus G8s in the field. 
Um, you know, if you say G8 in the field at the division level or the core level, the guys with the money, guys and gals with the money, they come running. Yeah. Up here, you're going to get the programmers and they're going to talk to you about the out year. So right now, uh, the programmers uh, are looking at um, fiscal year 22 through 26. Oh. Um, and then, then it comes to budget execution. This is also a funny time of, of the year because the programmers are handing over the program of fiscal year 22 to the budgeteers as we are going to start taking the program and turning it into a budget. And it's different. So the programmers look at the budget data or the, the money data in, in one direction. Um, they try to look at it across. And then, of course, as budgeteers, we look at it vertically, looking at fiscal years. So as they're comparison, comparing programs to one another, uh, we're looking at the year uh, comparison. Um, so it is a little bit different. Um, we've got the database now and we're, we're working through those differences. We're making sure that we're consistent with the long range plan that the programmers are put, have put together. Um, and that program of 22 to 26. So in the first year of fiscal year 22, we're starting to build what we call the budget estimate submission. And we are putting that in, into place. Now we will go through a series of uh, decision um, meetings and briefings. Uh, we'll get our decisions from the senior leaders that will carry us basically through December and January. By the end of the Jan end of January, we'll put together what we call the president's budget. I will roll the president's budget out the first uh, Monday in February, and that becomes the president's budget that is submitted for fiscal year 22. Now, simultaneously with all this, we've got the planning that is still going on. So though I am focusing on FY 20 execution, because I still have to spend the Army's money. We're looking to put the next year's budget, fiscal year 21. We are working with Congress to get that enacted. It would be great if we have that enacted by the 1st of October. Uh, if not, we are under a continuing resolution and we've, we've all been under that before. Uh, so we do have the experience on how to handle CRs. But then simultaneously, I'm, I'm looking at fiscal year 22. And oh, by the way, we also look backwards at the, the, the closed year. So, you know, these closed years are just as important because there's a lot of money that is still available in those closed years that can be executed if there is a reason to go to use that money. However, you could also call that lost purchasing power if we did not use it in the year that that money was appropriated. So I would rather and prefer to use that money in the year that it was given to us and, and enacted than to go back and use it in previous years, because you can only use it for requirements that were identified in those previous years. Awesome, sir. I, you know, it's, it's funny you mentioned that, the whole uh, G8 thing, because I remember when I walked in there uh, into the building, you know, I was like, oh, the G8. Long term, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, and then the G8 was co a completely different office, um, and Major Wally actually works there, so we were talking about that. Um, and then, you know, funny thing again, the BESS and the PB, I mean, that was a zoo, sir. Uh, it was a lot of moving pieces, a lot of work, uh, you know, and, and shout out to the DA civilians that work in ABO because they, they're really doing, you know, what, what they need to do to uh, to better enhance, you know, the overall mission of the Army as well. So that's great. Hey, the Army civilians that we have in the Army budget office are amazing. I would take my staff and put them up against anybody else, any other staff here in the Army. I wouldn't yeah. trade any one of them. They bleed green, they care about soldiers, and they want to do what's right for the Army. I've got cool. the best staff that there is in this building. Awesome, sir. Well, hopefully some of them are watching, so they're going to come in. On <laughs> sir, we got another question over here. Sir, is there any update to the 11 special measure agreement being established between the yeah. U.S. and Iraq? Will Army commands need to be prepared to pay for campaign labor up front starting at Fletcher and once there's no cost sharing has been established yet? So we, we first off, we probably need to let folks know what the special measure agreement is. And the special measure agreement is an agreement between the Republic of Korea and the United States um, 
where there is burden sharing of how much money does the Department of Defense pay and how much is the Republic of Korea going to pay for the forces that we have stationed there. Um, I'm certainly not going to get in front of the, the U.S. government and the administration in, in saying whether or not this is going to get done. There's a lot of negotiations going on. There's a lot of hard work. But prudent planning on our part is also going on. Um, to ensure that uh, if agreements do do not materialize, uh, or I'm sorry, if negotiations do not materialize in an agreement, um, then yes, we probably need to to make sure that we have at least a plan on how we would address some of the funding that may be required to make up the difference in that burden sharing. Gotcha. Awesome. Thank you, sir. Sir, we got a question. I'm not sure who it's from, but they say, sir, you know, some of these acronyms are getting me as well, sir. So, so sir... The was your first Army Comptroller job, and did you depend heavily on the NCOs? So I always depend heavily on the NCOs, and quite frankly, I think uh, our NCOs are an untapped resource that we've got to figure out. How do we better uh, utilize the NCOs, not just on the financial operations side, but also on the resource management side? We are a finance and a Comptroller branch. Um, I think there is plenty of opportunity for us to um, use our NCOs. Uh, we just need to figure out where and when. We probably also need to uh, also uh, work through how much and how much longer we will continue with the mill pay. We're not going to release the mill pay responsibility that we have until the Army G1 uh, and the AG folks are ready to take that on, and that is also going to be dependent upon IPSA. But wow. absolutely, the NCOs um, or I've always leaned heavily on the NCOs, uh, whether whether it's it was um, my last two SAR majors uh, there at Arsen, SAR Major Hendricks, uh, Henderson or um, SAR Major Ross, and of course uh, my Sergeant Majors there at SSI, uh, SAR Major uh, Weber and SAR Major Suggs. So a shout out to all of them, uh, great NCOs, uh, really, really uh, the epitome of what NCOs are supposed to be. Um, Moso side, so uh, the Military Operations, Special Operations, Special Operations Detachment down in G357 in the AOC or the Army Operations Center. They're wow. down in the basement. Yeah. Uh, they are now known as G3 side. That was not my first comptroller job. My first comptroller job was at JTF Bravo or Joint Joint Base Bravo in Honduras, uh, Joint Task Force Bravo in Honduras. Um, I, I got to tell you, that was probably one of the, the most rewarding experiences I had. Um, alone and unafraid as a captain with two classes that taught me how to be a comptroller. One was a RMBC or resource management uh, brigade officer course. And then the PEEBS course that was taught at Fort Jackson. Both courses were two weeks long and they said, go out and do great and wonderful things. Uh, the good news is I knew how to balance a checkbook and I used that experience uh, really more in uh, working the budget when I was there at JTO Bravo. I will tell you that um, the first time I had to certify funds uh, on on a travel order, uh, I was scared to death. Eleven hundred and sixty eight dollars and eighteen cents. I remember the number. Um, I grilled that poor young officer um, probably for about thirty minutes. Why are you going? Where are you going? How come you have to go for five days? Why can't you do this? How come you're staying at this hotel and not th this hotel? Um, yeah, it was. It was more of an experience for them than it was for me, probably. But I would tell you that I was also there during Hurricane Mitch. Um, and that was also when I realized that I was a staff officer and that I was really no longer um, part of the GO team, if you will. Uh, myself and uh, then uh, Captain Tommy Todd, who is now Lieutenant General Tommy Todd and one of the DCGs in your neck of the woods there at AFC. Um, he was the contracting officer and our offices were side by side. Uh, a net call went out that said, hey, we need all available hands to, to go down to the generator farm. Uh, the generator farm was right next to what was typically a trickling little stream that turned into a raging river when Hurricane Mitch came over Honduras. Um, as he and I were walking out of the building and getting ready to hop in our, uh, our golf carts to head down there, 
uh, then Colonel Jacoby, um, he came out and said, uh, where are you two knuckleheads going? He said, well, we're answering the net call. He said, that's not your job. Your job <laughs> is to go in there and buy me pickaxes, buy me sandbags, get me sand and gravel. And um, two young captains put their tails between their legs, mumbled under our breath, and we went back in. Um, but it was the right thing to do. Uh, and we did make a lot of emergency purchases that day. So uh, though it was eye-opening, uh, it, it also gave me a lot of good experiences on what does it take to, to really make sure that um, we are taking doing what is necessary to, to support a command, but also support the soldiers in a command. Exactly. So, I mean, that's awesome that you said that, because, I mean, in all reality, I mean, that's what you're supposed to be doing as a lieutenant, right? You should be worried about, you know, any kind of payment that you're going to be certifying. Um, and then in terms of, you know, when you were a captain, um, you know, your job was to make sure that, yes, you get the funds so that they can go ahead and they can buy the, the equipment that they need to complete the mission and, and sustain the mission as well. So, and, and it actually drives me into my next question. Um, this actually came in separately. It's from Lieutenant Colonel Navarro. Um, he asked that, what would you recommend for two courses for a new brigade SA? What, I, I didn't hear the question, I'm sorry. Well, what would you recommend, like two courses that a new brigade SA, someone going to a new SA job? Um, you know, I, the Dorm C course that, that used to be out there was a pretty good course. Uh, it really combined uh, contracting. It combined the, the PEEBS course. It combined the RMBC course. Um, and quite honestly, you know, that would be a, a, a good course. And then really, it's, it's making sure that you understand requirements. Um, making sure that uh, you understand what your brigade commander wants. Um, there's lots of times when folks will say, you know, I need a truck. Well, I, I can't get you a truck. We need a little more details than I need a truck. So it's, it's really working towards defining um, what is the requirement and articulating the, re the requirement well. So that, that's what I would, I would probably explain and, and talk with most brigade S8s over. Sir, and then again, we kind of spoke about it. You talked about your relationship with the NCOs that you did work with. Um, so another question that we did have was, what's the likelihood of the number of junior soldiers in RM jobs increasing? Um, and in particular, having more you know, sergeants or staff sergeants in brigade S8s or divisions or core level? Yeah, we're, so the good news is we put this thing together called the Force Design Update Junior. It's an FDU Junior. Uh, so again, that is to help us be prepared to support large scale combat operations. Um, as we're putting that together, uh, we're going to have uh, an opportunity and create opportunities, uh, for officers as well as the NCOs, both within those, within the FDU. And then, and for those who don't understand what the FDU junior is doing, the FDU junior is going to take our FIMSUs and convert them into uh, battalions and take our detachments and make them companies. Why? Because that's the language that we speak in the army, battalions and companies. Uh, FIMSUs and detachments are hard for other, other branches to recognize because that's not how they talk. So there'll be some opportunities there. Um, we are creating opportunities uh, for um, NCOs uh, within uh, the S8s. I don't know that they're going to grow. I don't think any of the division uh, G8 sections are going to grow because anything that we do is going to have to be zero growth. But as we continue to move forward with the FDU Junior, as we continue to move forward with uh, where General Horlander is taking us uh, and taking the finance and comptroller profession, uh, there will be opportunities for NCOs, and we're going to start making opportunities for NCOs. For example, in Army Futures Command, uh, that was one of the things that we wanted to do and make sure that we did. And as a result, uh, we were able to build several uh, NCO billets into the Army Budget Office there at Army Futures Command. Wow. Um, I'm also working to uh, bring some NCOs along with Sergeant Major Cabell. Um, bring them here into the, the Pentagon. In fact, you were a recipient 
uh, of that. Uh, you and, and uh, three other NCOs have been up here on a TDY basis uh, working as LNOs for Army's Future Command. Um, regrettably, we haven't been able to get you up here for a full year so you could see a full budget cycle, uh, but, but we're working on, on changing that. But there are going to be opportunities. We're going to continue to develop them. Uh, I've also worked to try to find ways to get young officers here into the building. Um, when I was here as, as, a, as a captain and a major um, within the Army Budget Office and not including the folks, uh, the officers that are in uh, the budget liaison office because they actually are on somebody else's TDA. So they don't really, they work with us here in the Army Budget Office, but technically they belong to somebody else. Um, so on our um, uh, personnel doctrine or uh, document, uh, we used to have 36 or 38 officers that were working in the Army Budget Office. Uh, now we're down to 21, and about 10 of them are here uh, on the E-ring taking care of myself and General Horlander. That only leaves about 11 billets out in the rings. Uh, the rings are where we have the, the, the different directorates that I was talking about earlier. So it's really not that many. Um, I brought in two lieutenants. Uh, about two years ago, Captain Torre and Captain Hacker, even though he is an Alabama grad and Alabama fan, um, but we brought them in and uh, we they were here for, for two years. So we're going to continue to try to do that uh, to the best of my ability, but uh, some personnel policies may limit that, but we'll have to work through them. Roger that, sir. Sir, i got a question up here. Um, sir, how do we change the culture or stigma that commanders being physically responsible and potentially returning funds at end of year is a negative thing? Well, that's where I, I got to go back to the G8s. And that's a long, long uh, conversation that, that you have to have repetitively with our commanders. Um, Look, it's 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 hard. Uh, I'm not going to lie. There's just it is hard for anybody to say I want to turn money in, uh, especially when everybody has more requirements than they do money. Uh, but what but we ha we have to understand is does buying 30 new computers that really are not necessary for life cycle replacement more important than sending a unit to another rotation or doing home station training? Um, it's, it's about balancing readiness. It's about balancing the requirement. Um, and quite honestly, it is really, uh, like I said, a long-term kind of conversation that you have to have to set the conditions. Um, but honestly, most commanders, they understand it, um, that, that if there is money available and they can't spend it, they're going to turn it in. What I would tell you is I'd like them to be able to identify it earlier because when you give it back to the Army for us to, to perhaps move around to other commands, it's it's hard to do that in the last 30 days of the fiscal year, uh, right. especially when they give it back in the last week of the fiscal year where you have to find folks who have the ability to execute that money uh, quickly. But that means that we as comptrollers need to work with our contracting officers, need to work with our force, uh, need to work with the engineers to ensure that we have a list of, you know, if you want to call them shovel ready projects, you can call them shovel ready projects. Um, but you have a list of where you know that you can put money and execute it quickly. Well, thanks, sir. So uh, two weeks ago, you know, Lieutenant General Horlander uh, was on here and, and he kind of spoke about the CARE program. And uh, we actually got a question that, that comes in um, and says that now that we're working hard on, on care, do we anticipate programmatic reductions based on the obligations? Yes. Okay, awesome. <laughs> hey, I mean, Colonel it's, Davis goes, that's what care is all about, so. Hey, look, this, this is what, what, care is not about the de obligations. It really isn't. That is, okay. that is a separate action that happens within our accounting. What CARE is about is identifying and making sure that we can expose what is going on and share what is going on with our senior leaders and our commanders so that they can make the decisions in the year of execution so that instead of losing that purchasing power, we can have that purchasing power right now today. 
So we have more money to send people to home station training. So we have more money to go and buy parts. So, I mean, think about it. 1%. Everybody says, what's 1%? If you execute 99% of the budget, that's an A. In fact, most people would call that an A+. Mm -hmm. The Army budget is $180 billion. 1% of $180 billion is $1.8 billion. That's a lot of money. A lot of money, yeah. But that's 1%. That's what 1% equals. So if CARES can help us save $1.8 billion in a year, I can get after hundreds of millions of dollars worth of facility upgrades, life cycle replacements. I can send another unit to additional training. Now, you also have to remember, you know, $1.8 billion. $1.8 billion equates to about a 3% pay raise to everybody. And look, it's not exactly one for one. And, and there's a lot of different uh, calculations that go into that. But $1.8 billion, um, if we had real growth, that would be great. But $1.8 billion, and remember I said our top line was going to stay flat. Our pay raise comes out of that $180 billion. If that doesn't go up, something else within that $180 billion has to come down because our military pay goes up. We all deserve the pay raise. We all work hard, but that money has to come from somewhere. Agree, sir. And, and there's, there's people in the comments talking about they'll spend the extra money and they're, they're bringing their commands. That's just pretty funny, sir. But I, I do agree. <laughs> That's a lot of money. Um, and, and obviously, you know, being at the ACOM that I'm at, and seeing what we can do with extra money, um, it's it, you know obviously yeah we should all you know work towards that. Um, sir, we, we earlier you kind of like broke down the whole peach process, right? The being in the Pentagon, yeah, you did, you definitely did. Um, there's also there's PPBC, and you're the you're the co-chair on there, sir. Tri chair. Um, what was that, sir? We're a tri chair. A, a tri chair, agree? Yes, tri chair, yes. So let's let's talk about that a little. Again, you don't have to like go into like full detail, but at least give a, give the audience a snippet of what that is and how it works. Sir. So the planning pro programming budget committee is a weekly meeting. It occurs Thursday mornings at nine o'clock. It happens uh, is probably one of the few meetings that Harley has ever canceled uh, in the Pentagon. Uh, and within the PBBC, uh, we go through the entire PEBS process. So we look at the planning, and in fact, that's what the G3 is doing now. So they're looking at the planning issues, and I think I told you there was 50-some planning issues, uh, and they are presented, and, and we discuss them in there. Uh, when those issues are handed over to go into programming, that's when uh, the G8, uh, and particularly the PA&E, Program Analysis and Evaluation Division, um, they, they take it and then they start figuring out the program and how are we going to resource all of the Army from whatever fiscal year, we'll just use 22 to, to 26. I sit in there uh, primarily to help um, remind folks that their decisions that they make about the out years can impact the current year. I also help remind them that if you are um, creating a program in 22 that Perhaps, and AFC is, is worthy of this, sometimes you create a year of execution build that we have to find a way to help resource. Um, so that's why it is part of a, a tri-chair where you have uh, myself as the director of the Army budget. You have the director of PA&E, General Gingrich, and then you have the deputy G357, General Major General uh, Swindell. So the three of us try chair that meeting to ensure that we cover the planning, the programming, and then of course the budgeting and the execution. Thank you. Sir, we got another question. Um, sir, are there plans to standardize SH system access or fund certification across all core and divisions? Hey, I, I am all about standardization. I'm all about processes uh, because you have to have processes uh, in, in order to ensure that everything is looked at, uh, to ensure everybody gets a chance to go ahead and, and have their say as to whether or not it's good, bad, uh, or if there's a better way to get after a requirement. 
Um, so yes, we should be standardizing it. We're working on standardizing it through GFEBS. We're working on standardizing it through other software uh, products and programs that we're getting ready to, to eventually push out here once they're mature enough. Thank you. We got another question, sir. Uh, whoop, not that. Recoloring money, <laughs> recoloring money is, is hard. Exactly. It's it's very know. hard. You have to go find a new crayon. <laughs> So, so this is the question, sir. Uh, what is the preferred CSL for Lieutenant, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Battalion Command or a GA? Hey, hey look, this, this is a personal preference. Um, I, I would tell you that if somebody has a desire to command, then they ought to try and command. Um, if, if you prefer doing the, the, the resourcing, then be a Division G8. Um, right now, uh, I would tell you both are viewed the same way. They're CSL. It comes down to a manner of performance. So go out and do the best that you can in whatever job you're in. Awesome. Thank you. Um, is there a reason why you answered it like that, sir? I don't understand the question. I might other start than that, like you know, other than other than obviously what you do want to do because that's going to be a, a the biggest factor probably in how you um, how you perform in those kind of you know positions. It's all about but, a matter of performance. Hey, look if you're if if you're handing out basketballs in a gym somewhere, be the best basketball hander out of there is. All right, you want to be known as the person who ensures that you hand out the most inflated ball that has the best grip on it. And that if there's a problem that you happily make an exchange for a better ball with folks, it doesn't matter what your job is, do it the best to your ability and everything else will take care of themselves. Cool. Awesome, sir. Thank you. We got another question. Uh, do we expect any challenges and additional costs to the army if the visiting forces agreement with the Philippines is not reapproved? Uh, well, I'll just show my ignorance on this one. I'm not tracking this as an issue and I'll have to go out and do a little bit of research before I can provide an answer. Uh, we did talk about it. You broke up a little bit, sorry, Singh. Sorry about that. I'm trying to read the question. Uh, no worries, sir. So we have this one. Uh, you kind of talked about this in terms of, you know, how we can spend our money. So the question goes, sir, with the 21st modernization, is, is there any plans to ensure money goes to the highest priority activities? This is someone obviously that wants, you know, IPSA dollars. <laughs> uh, yes, we will always ensure that money goes to the Army's highest priority requirements, whether that's IPSA or another weapon system. I don't make those calls. Uh, we have entire processes, the PPBC. We also have other things called uh, um, uh, defense management uh, work groups. Uh, all of those different offices and committees, they all, and, and obviously our senior leaders also get to weigh in on a lot of these. They will help prioritize what our requirements are. And we will make sure that the money goes to the highest priorities. There are a lot of priorities that the Army has. Agree. I think, uh, you know, everyone obviously looks from their Fox all only. So, um, you know, that, that just ends up happening, sir. You know, we only look at it from one side. And You're that's okay. That's okay. We want folks who are passionate about the, the job that they're in and the programs that they are working with. However, we as comptrollers, uh, finance and comptrollers, we're supposed to be the honest brokers. We're supposed to be able to weigh the good and the bad, provide the pros and the cons. We need to do that because other folks who may be just as passionate are not necessarily going to have that honest broker approach because that's not really where they need to be. They are supposed to be advocates for their programs. We are the folks who need to stay in the middle and ensure that we provide commanders and leaders and the decision makers if you make this decision, this is one This is one thing that will happen. If you make this one, this is the other thing that could happen. Are you okay with which one? That's what we have to make sure that we ensure all of our leaders know before they make a decision. An informed decision-making process is a powerful decision-making process. Cool. Sir, let me ask you this, right? So obviously with COVID-19 happening, um, obviously that was, you know, the way your life changed. Right. Um, so you, you mentioned earlier over 20 something thousand people working in the, 
in the building and then suddenly it was gone to you know like maybe what a thousand if that i know you were still going in you know obviously you had to be there and so forth what is the biggest lesson learned uh in in regards to you know from avo what's one of the biggest lessons learned so i would tell you that um and it's not just in ABO, it's probably across all of the Department of Defense, that uh, we probably have the ability to do more uh, telework. Uh, we've proven that um, out of necessity, we have proven that. Um, I know that there are some folks who thought that teleworking would be great and wonderful, and they come to realize that uh, they actually missed the camaraderie of coming in uh, and being able to talk to folks every day. There are some folks who, I would tell you that we probably were scratching our head whether or not they would be successful uh, teleworkers, and they are absolutely astounding. They get more work done now than they, they were able to get done when they were here in the building. So it's a mix. Um, it certainly is a, a learning environment, and we will continue to, to work through this. Uh, right now, I would tell you that I still have not brought a lot of folks into the Army Budget Office. Uh, we have successfully been able to use teleworking to the max uh, over the course of the last five months. Now, I don't know if I'll be able to do that as we continue to go forward, because there'll be different periods in a year um, where it'll it'll probably be necessary to, to bring some folks in or more folks in. Um, as we continue to work on the BESS or the budget estimate submission, um, and a lot of that is done on the classified networks, uh, mm -hmm. we'll have to bring folks in for that. Uh, of course, as we're getting ready to, to build the, the budget rollout materials come December and January, I'm not quite sure that um, we can we can do that as remotely as we with folks working now. We'll probably need to bring some folks in for that. So there will be different times throughout the year. Year in close is another time that we'll probably have to take a look and see see if we can bring some folks in. But look, we're going to try to do it as smartly as we can. Uh, we're not going to try to put people at risk. We're going to try to account for everybody's uh, individual situations. But when it comes down to it in the end, the mission is still the mission and we're going to have to get that accomplished. Um, whether it's year end close or rolling out the budget, we'll have to figure out what the right mix of people are um, and balance that with safety. Awesome, sir. So, sir, we got one more question over here. It says, do you see a time when we will be able to use predictive and analytics at the strategic level to determine future financial needs or budget execution rates? Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Hey, look, it is one of our new competencies. We have eight competencies. It's one of our new ones. And quite honestly, data analytics, big data, whatever you want to call it, um, it is here to stay. Uh, it is something that um, we, because one, uh, numbers and budgeting does lend itself to it. We need to be the go to data analytics folks in any organization. Um, we're building that into the schoolhouse. Uh, they've developed some uh, programs and courses there at the University of South Carolina uh, that allow us to capitalize on um, the classes that they have there uh, in, in the university. So look, yes, this is going to be something that uh, will continue to evolve and mature, and we're going to be at the heart of it. Uh, it'll also be part of what we do when we look at yet another one of our uh, new competencies, which is counter threat financing. Uh, a lot of that is looking at the ones and zeros, looking at the accounts, doing all that data mining kind of stuff. And we need folks with that skill set. So that'll be something else that we'll take a look at um, as we continue to go forward. So, sir, this, this probably had nothing to do with the finance and comptroller arena. Um, but, you know, hey, I got to ask, you know, just simple questions just to get to know you a little bit better, right? So what's your favorite beverage? My favorite beverage is milk. I like an ice cold glass of milk and it needs to have ice in it because I don't care how cold you have your refrigerator. It's never cold enough. So it's no more than one ice cube because any more than one ice cube makes it watered down and the best thing to eat and the best thing to eat with it is oreo cookies or russian tea balls gotcha so i hope uh you know <laughs> someone's listening you're probably gonna be like okay let me note this thing uh what about we well we know hey, here's, what I, here's what i don't want What's do not that? put a glass of milk in front of me in a meeting <laughs> why not it is your favorite beverage now 
Just don't do it. Okay, got it. All right. How about um? Well, you said cookie, but that goes with the milk. But what's your favorite food, sir? Popcorn. And speaking of popcorn, I understand that there might be a young future soldier who is out there at Fort Hood with one major Jeremy Parr. So Alexander Parr, if you're out there and listening with dad, enjoy that popcorn. But just know that in about uh, 18 to 20 years or so, we've got a spot for you in the Finance and Comptroller Corps. There you go. So, sir, behind you, right, I see a couple of things. Um, I, I mean, I know you're a huge football fan, sir. And we've, we've spoken and stuff, but there's some stuff, sir. Go ahead and uh, just tell us a little bit, a bit about it. Uh, well, you got the little orange ball from Syracuse. Obviously, yep. Clemson helmet for Clemson University. You can't see it in front of it. I'm a New York Giants fan, so go Giants. On the other side over here is a football that I got from the NCOs at the NCO Academy. You probably have a signature on it somewhere. Uh, it was presented to me when I was at the Soldier Support Institute. And then behind me, you can see a old finance poster uh, from World War II and World War One. Nice, awesome. Yeah, I, um, I knew I knew you were, you know, most likely going to bring something football, so I, I brought a jersey as well. You know, that one of my old students gave me, and it's got the thirty-six on it, Army Knights University. Uh, Jersey, so it's pretty cool. Um, we'll, but we can root for the 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 uh, Golden Knights. No, or the, yeah. Excuse me. So, sir, um, you know, again, I just wanted to say thank you. All right, um, the entire finance core appreciates this. Uh, we know your time is valuable. Uh, you're still at work, you know, at the Pentagon. You could have been home. Most likely, probably not, because you'd still be working. But uh, I do want to thank you again for taking this time to, you know, spend this hour with us, answering several questions that came in uh, for the audience. If I was unable to ask some of those questions, it's again time limit. Um, but sir, before we leave, any parting words? Yeah. So uh, one, thanks for having me. Uh, but I do want to also thank my family for supporting me for 32 years uh, in the army. Um, it's been a great ride. I could not have done it without my wife. She's a rock. Um, put her through lots and lots of different challenges. And uh, like a good army spouse, uh, she went ahead and fixed all of my mess up. So I, I thank Laura. I got two great boys I'm very proud of. Um, they're doing great and wonderful things. They're a little bit older now, so uh, they're, they're not necessarily in the house, but I'm really excited uh, with what they're doing. So uh, I want to just say thanks to the family. I love you guys. And then I would also probably tell you, um, hey, just remember the golden rule, folks. The, the secret to success is taking care of people. Um, if you take care of, of, of your team, your workforce, they're going to take care of you. Uh, I, I have been very fortunate with the folks uh, in my career. Um, I'm certainly not the fast enough, you know, the fastest person. I'm not the strongest person. I don't know much about comptrollering. I don't know a whole lot about uh, budgeting. I can barely add numbers besides single digits. Uh, I struggle with percentages and multiplication, but I've got an incredible team both here and I've had an incredible team ever since I've come in the army um, and working well with them and taking care of them is what leads to having a successful career. Oh, thank you very much, sir. Um, and again, I do want to thank your wife as well, because uh, I know I, I messaged her several times to be like, "We need to get, <laughs> we need to get your husband on here." So uh, again, thank you very much. Um, and once again, to the audience, thank you for tuning in. Uh, we'll see you in two weeks again, and uh, everyone have a blessed and safe weekend. Thank you. Yep. Go Giants. Go Tigers. I'll say go John, sir. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Be